Good afternoon. Welcome to a conversation with Dr. Janetta Betch Cole. I want to thank our executive committee members who are on the call with us tonight, our members who give us their time, talent, and treasure to make NCNW relevant and strong. I want to extend a special welcome to our corporate sponsors who are joining us this evening. NCNW has a unique structure that gives it strength and durability. We are an organization of organizations. We reach more than 2 million Black women in 32 states through 300 sections, which are comparable to chapters. 80 of our sections are located on college campuses as diverse as Spelman College and the University of Michigan. There is another very special group of guests in the meeting tonight. They are our affiliates, 32 national black women's organizations. The affiliates each have a seat on our board of directors. We welcome to all of our life and legacy life members, president circle members, collegiate members, and each of you are very special guests and friends. I am Janice Mathis, and I, along with Ms. Crystal Ramser, our Chief Administrative Officer, and our colleagues, Ms. Holder, Ms. Green, Ms. Stovall, Ms. Perkins, Ms. Todd, Ms. Faleka, Ms. Wheeler, Mr. Glenn, Ms. Kuhn, and Ms. Todd are all part of what it takes to make up the National Council of Negro Women. Tonight, we owe a very special debt of gratitude to Mr. Johannes. It is through his technical expertise that we're able to host this meeting tonight. Together, we comprise the family of the National Council of Negro Women, where we are fortified by 85 years of service to women of African descent, their families, and communities. Tonight, the proposition is Black Women in Corporate America. But before I introduce our subject matter expert, I want to provide a little background data as a way of setting the stage for tonight's conversation. Mr. Johannes will give us some tips now to make sure that we get the most out of this Zoom platform. Good evening. As you are on Zoom by your computer, your iPad, Surface, or phone, uh, we have you on mute at this particular time. However, you can get to ask your question during the question and answer period near the end. You will see if you're on a smartphone, a hand. You tap that, we will know that you have a question to ask. Those of you who do the same thing on your regular phone, you can press the number one, in which case we will identify you by your last four digits of your phone number. Thank you, Mr. Johannes. And as you will be advancing the slides, I will just say next when we're ready to go to the next side, a courageous conversation, advancing black women in corporate America. Let's set the table for tonight's discussion. We'll look at some background data We'll introduce Dr. Cole, she will make a presentation and we will conclude with questions and answers from you, our audience. When you think about advancing black women in corporate America, you have to look at several aspects of our lives, health, employment, wealth, education and motivation and inspiration are just a few of the domains that we need to touch on. And we'll do that quickly. COVID-19 has proven to be disproportionately fatal to Black people. You may not be able to see the numbers on the slide, but you can see the direction of the arrows, which tell you that black folk are two to three times more likely to die from COVID-19 than they are represented in the population. For example, if you are 26% of the population in Wisconsin, you make up 73% of the COVID deaths. 
if you are only 32% of Chicago's population, you make up 67% of the deaths from COVID. Let's go on to the next. For several months now, many of us have been working from home, but not everyone can work from home. Fewer than one in five black workers and roughly one in six Hispanic workers have careers or jobs that enable them to work from home. About a decade ago, we went through what we now call the Great Recession. As we came out of the Great Recession, the employment rate for Black women between the ages of 25 and 34 was higher in 2016 at the end of the recession than it was for white women in 2010, where the unemployment rate was 7.7%. In other words, when America gets a cold, we get pneumonia. Let's move on. The wage gap. Women overall earn 82% of what non-Hispanic white men earn. According to the United States Census, on average, Black women were paid 61% of what non-Hispanic white men were paid in 2018. The typical Black woman works 19, not nine, but 19 months to earn what the average white man earns in a year. For every 100 men promoted, only 58 women of color were promoted. And of course, we know that women of color includes more than just black women, but that is the lowest proportion of any race or ethnic group of women. One in five C-suite executives is a woman. We've made some progress, about 20%, but only one in 25 C-suite executives is a woman of color. Black women and the wealth gap. The net worth of a typical white family is about $171,000. That is 10 times what the net worth of a typical black family was, $17,000 in 2016. The 2016 wealth gap has not changed much since 1962 before the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. Black women and wealth accumulation. Black Americans lost half their wealth during the Great Recession, largely attributable to repossession of homes in which they had equity. A recent Federal Reserve Board survey shows that a Black person with a BA degree has a median net worth that is two thirds of the median net worth of a white person with no bachelor's degree. Black Americans, especially Black women, are more likely to financially support needy family members. And that support carries with it a significant cost. Middle class Black families suffered more than a 25% reduction in their wealth relative to white families as a result of supporting kin networks. Look at these average assets held by women, both black and white. We're comparing in this chart white single women to black single women. White single women in 2016 held about $94,000 in equity in their homes. By contrast, black single women in the same age group held only $34,000 in homeowners equity. Let's look at retirement savings. 
white women on the average had $56,514 in retirement savings. Black women by comparison in 2016 had only $13,405 in retirement savings. And this huge category of non-retirement assets, white women had $124,000 in non-retirement assets compared to just a minuscule amount for black women. Let's look at education. Elite education, we think, gives us an edge, and maybe it does. But between 1977 and 2015, only 13% of black female Harvard Business School graduates reached the senior most executive ranks. 40% of non-African American Harvard MBA degree holders reached the top executive ranks by comparison. 1.3% of executives and senior level managers in S&P 500 companies are black women. By comparison, nearly 22% of executives and senior managers are women of color, are, are white women, and 5% are women of color. We all know that work is changing. Today, African Americans are overrepresented in occupations likely to be most affected by automation. If you think about who checks you out of the grocery store? Who takes your parking fees? You realize that we are overrepresented in occupations likely to be affected by automation. African Americans are also underrepresented in the occupational categories that are most resistant to automation based displacement. That means we are underrepresented in professions such as education, health, business, and law in which there may be a net gain in jobs despite technological advance. I will conclude with this. It's an old canard, but the pandemic is proving it true. An injury to one is an injury to all. The Financial Times recently concluded that in a time of contagion, when disease is contagious, the case for universal health care has found painful simplicity. Unless everyone has care, no one does. Now, with that little background setting the table, let me have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this evening. We know that she has been a museum director. She has been president of two black colleges, the only two black colleges for women in the United States, both Spelman and Bennett. She has served on the boards of corporate uh, companies, corporate uh, entity, entities, and she is an advisor to them. She is a repository of African wisdom in the proverbs that she often quotes. She's a caring, dedicated scholar, activist, noted anthropologist who has the courage to lead and yet the humility to follow. Please join me in welcoming Janetta Betch Cole, PhD. Good afternoon. I want to begin my comments by thanking Sister Executive Director Janice Mathis. I want to thank her for her highly informative presentation, but also for the day to day way in which she helped us to move NCNW's programmatic agenda forward. As always, I'm grateful to my NCNW sisters and brothers, my siblings all, who lend their support whenever we present a webinar, and of course, in our daily work. I also want to thank everyone who's joined this webinar about race and gender as we pose this question. Where are the black women 
in corporate America. There's a great deal of wisdom in the African-American expression that says, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. In order to understand the challenges that face African-American women in today's corporate world, we need to look way back. Indeed, we need to go back 401 years to that day when 20 enslaved African women and men were brought ashore in what was then British Virginia. We go that, back that far because in order for black women and men to be enslaved, to go through that brutality that enslavement involved, there had to be an explanation. There had to be a reason why black people were being treated as they were. That explanation was, of course, that Black women, Black men, Black children are inherently inferior to all white people. Stereotypes of Black women, men, and children were institutionalized and promoted throughout the periods of enslavement, reconstruction, the Jim Crow era, through the period of the civil rights movement down to this very day. In the late 1960s, civil rights activist Frances Beale wrote a book that she entitled Double Jeopardy to be black and female. Beale documented how black women face far greater disadvantages than black men and white women because they are subjected to a double jeopardy, systemic racism and systemic sexism. Years later, in 1989, legal scholar and professor Kimberly Crenshaw laid out her theory of intersectionality, a theory to explain how aspects of a person's identities, such as race, gender, class, sexuality, etc., might combine to create unique modes of discrimination as well as privilege. Professor Crenshaw shed light on how Black women often face discrimination due to a combination of their race and gender. These concepts of double jeopardy and intersectionality not only help to explain how African-American women have been treated for 401 years in our country, but also how our contributions have often been marginalized and ignored. For example, when most Americans think of the abolitionist movement, they think of Harriet Beecher Stowe, William Lord Garrison, John Brown. Hopefully they'll remember Frederick Douglass. And perhaps because of a recent film, Harriet Tubman. But Harriet Tubman was not alone we must call the names of at least these four 
black women abolitionists. Elizabeth Freeman, Francis E. W. Harper, Sarah Parker Redmond, and of course, Sojourner Truth. Now, if you ask a middle school student, who led the suffrage movement? Who led the movement for women to have the right to vote? You will likely hear the names Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone. It is equally unlikely that you will hear these names of some of the black women suffragettes. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Fortin Purvis, Angelina Well Grimke, Mary Ann Shad Cady, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Mary Church Terrell, and of course, Ida B. Wells Barnett. Now, if you ask, let's say, an American person standing on the corner, who do you consider the most important champions for the civil rights of Black people? You will clearly hear the names Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and probably Congressman John Lewis. It is doubtful that that individual on the corner will mention Ella Baker, Daisy Bates, Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, or the National Council of Negro Women's Own, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, and Dr. Dorothy Irene Hyatt. How well you all know that we are in a time of intense racial turmoil in our nation. A time of turmoil that seems to be in particular response to the brutal killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman, along with the recent killings of Ahmoud Aubrey, Tony McDade, Rashad Brooks, and of course these violent deaths of black men are added to the list of police officers killing so many black men throughout history. But in more recent times, the list includes, of course, Rodney King, Eric Gardner, Walter Scott, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, and so many, 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 many others. These unjustifiable and horrific killings are a visceral reminder of our barbaric history. Our nation's barbaric history of racial violence against black men, including the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of black men who were lynched. But now I must ask, why did it take so long for attention to be directed to the killing of Breonna Taylor in her own home by the Louisville police? And what about the killings of Ayanna Stanley Jones, Tanisha Anderson, Atatiana Jefferson, Charlena Lyles, and so many other Black women. Nearly 
of all African-American women killed in police encounters are unarmed. And yet these killings rarely get much attention in the news. As Fran Beale noted in her book, Double Jeopardy, the pain, the trauma, the suffering that Black women experience is largely ignored by the general American public. But of course, since that year of 400, or rather since 401 years ago, gains have been made in the lives of Black women. Gains made in education, gains made in employment. But we have to own that the double jeopardy of racism and sexism continue to negatively impact African-American women in the workplace. This double jeopardy affects our ability to get hired, to get promoted, and to advance in workplaces, including corporate America. Indeed, African-American women are the most underrepresented group at every level in corporate America. There's a demographic reality that is certainly not reflected in the makeup of American workplaces, including corporate ones. That demographic reality is that by the year 2050, minority people will become the majority in the United States. And yet today, African Americans make up only 8% of white collar employees. Among Fortune 500 companies, Black women make up less than 2% of middle managers. When we look at Fortune 500 companies, there are only four African American men who are CEOs. And now the reality with respect to black women. Miss Ursula Burns was the first and only black woman to occupy the top position at a fortune 500 firm. Since she left her position at Xerox in 2016, we're now in 2020, there are no Black women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And what about where other folk are in corporate America. I don't have the data about where Black women are on boards in Fortune 500 companies. But here is data that I do have. White men hold two-thirds of all board seats on Fortune 500 boards. White women hold nearly four times as many seats as are held by women of color. And women of color hold only 4.6% of Fortune 500 board seats. 
African-American women face a daunting array of challenges as they try to succeed in corporate America. One of the biggest challenges is how to overcome negative stereotypes. Negative stereotypes that were set 400 years ago and they persist to this very day. These stereotypes often have a negative impact on how black women are treated at work. The support they receive from co-workers and supervisors on their chances for advancement. Three stereotypes in particular have been especially harmful to black women. The first stereotype is that of the angry black woman. This archetype is characterized as an individual who has a mean, loud, and overbearing personality. Almost every African American woman that I know has had to fight this label, including First Lady Michelle Obama, Miss Oprah Winfrey, and tennis champion Serena Williams. In the workplace, this stereotype often leads to African American women being labeled as intimidating, not easy to work with, which of course makes it even more difficult for them to succeed. The second stereotype is that of the mammy. This archetype of the portly, asexual, and fierce caretaker as portrayed in Gone with the Wind reinforces the absurd notion that black women will bear any burden, not because they have to, but because they just sort of live to bear burdens. The mammy is one who is always willing to give and never asks for or never takes what she needs. She's portrayed as being content with her place in society. Now, whether applied consciously or unconsciously, this stereotype can often result in African-American women being passed over for promotions and advancement. The third stereotype of Black women in the workplace, well, it's the Jezebel. This is the myth of Black women as being voraciously sexual. It's that myth, that stereotype that was used during antebellum days to excuse the routine sexual exploitation of enslaved Black women. The ongoing persistence of this stereotype makes Black women less likely to be believed when they are violated, whether in a domestic setting or a work setting. James Baldwin, that very important African-American writer, once wrote these words, not everything that is faced can be changed, but not thing can be changed that is not faced. So how do we face the reality that Black women encounter enormous challenges in entering and in succeeding in corporate America? Before I address 
at least a few actions that should be put in place so that Black women can indeed enter and succeed in corporate America. I want to suggest four concrete steps that should be taken to address how great a diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion can be brought into any workplace in the interest of all, all marginalized communities. Whether these are individuals marginalized on the basis of their race, their gender, religion, class, based on their ability or disability, based on their sexual orientation. First, corporate leaders must make diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion in their companies a top priority. Every corporate decision needs to be analyzed with regard to how it will advance diversity and inclusion. Secondly, corporate leaders must speak up and speak out and do so consistently about what their companies are doing to bring great, greater equity into the work place. As the poet and activist Audre Lorde once said, your silence will not protect you. Companies that do not seriously address diversity and inclusion will increasingly find themselves at a strategic disadvantage in this increasingly diverse and interconnected world. Numerous studies, including one by McKinsey and Company, found that those companies, those companies which have highly diverse employees, boards, leaders have a 33% chance of being more profitable than companies that are not diverse and inclusive. Thirdly, managers, executives, and corporate boards need to work closely with chief diversity officers and human resources departments to craft and implement diversity initiatives that promote sustained positive changes in the workplace. And actualizing diversity and inclusion plans must be a part of the responsibility, not just of human resource folk, not just of chief diversity officers, not just of the leadership team, but of every person in a company. Fourth and finally, diversity goals must be clearly established for all levels of the company with incentives for reaching those goals and consequences when they are not met. Now, as I move toward conclusion, I want to urge leaders in corporate America to take these specific steps as minimal efforts to address the paucity of Black women in their organizations. One, require unconscious bias training for all employees with a refresher course 
for those of your colleagues engaged in searches and the hiring of new colleagues. Two, set goals for hiring, not just women, but diverse women. Set goals for hiring diverse women into first level managed positions. Thirdly, insist that all searches for hiring new employees must have diverse pools that include black women. Fourth and finally, institute leadership training, sponsorship and high profile assignments to make sure that black women are among the women in line for the step up of managerial positions. Now I acknowledge that it will not be easy to address and correct the paucity of black women in corporate America. But like with any difficult task, it can be done. It can be done if there is focus, if there is persistence, if there is determination, and of course, if there is collaboration. So let me end with an African proverb. This is one that comes from Ethiopia. It says, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. Let us hope that during this period of increased acknowledgement of racial inequities across our country, that corporate America will unite to make sure that Black women are a part of corporate America. Thank you so much for listening. And now I want to turn it back to Sister Executive Director Janice Mathis, to lead us through our Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Cole. I know we don't ordinarily applaud at the end of a Zoom presentation, but I just feel the need to applaud a little bit. I just feel that you've shared so much with us and done it in such a gracious, gracious way that we owe you a debt of gratitude. And I don't know if you could see the comments that were scrolling across the screen from the chat box, but they were all affirmations of the wisdom that you shared with us. And now we're going to take a little more from you. There is a symbol, if you touch your screen, you can raise your hand and be recognized for a question or comment. Sasha says, awesome presentation, Dr. Cole. Mr. Johannes, will you remind our audience how to be recognized, please? Yes, ma'am. If you are on your computer, it's on the bottom shelf of your menu bar. It looks like a little hand. If you're on your smartphone, it should be on the bottom for Android and top left for uh, iPhone. If you are on your regular phone just listening in, I believe you can press the number one. And let me say, Sister E.D., that while you and I are more than willing and anxious to respond to questions, we're also inviting comments. Yes. Now, I got to say it this way, you know, comments, we, we don't need to exactly go into the Baptist tradition of testifying here, but... Say what's on your heart. Say how you're feeling about this question. Where are black women 
in corporate America. You can also pose a question using your chat box. We see the chat messages as they come through. So if that's more convenient for you, please pose your question or make your comment by using the chat box where you type in your message. Ms. Anna Jenis, you have the floor. Unmute, please. All right. Ms. Paulette, you have the floor. Unmute, please. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Cole. That was uh, enlightening, but it's also a bit of deja vu for me. I don't know if you're aware that Secretary Herman and I started an organization in Atlanta in 1972 to place black women in management, technical and professional jobs in private industry because uh, data in, it indicated that our presence was uh, statistically insignificant. And over 10 years in 10 cities, we managed to place 2,500 black women in those types of jobs uh, around, around the country many of whom are, are beginning to retire now. So that's been very inspiring to see those women throughout the years. But one of our most important efforts was in 19, was during the late eight, 80s and early 90s, we worked with Procter & Gamble, who at, at the time uh, had recruited 99% of all black female engineers. But they found that they were leaving in three years and they wanted to know why. So Secretary Herman went in with her company and I was a consultant for her. Um, and what we found was that many of the women left because they felt like they were a failure. When they went into the companies, the companies put them in a corner and gave them a little work trying to um, show, give them an opportunity to succeed. But, but what they felt like was that they failed because they were not contributing to the company. Long story short, we initiated a training uh, initiative and we insisted on three levels of management to participate uh, in the training with, with the woman in, in, in their line. And uh, we worked with them. One of the biggest problems was communication. Another was that many of the women uh, were the first time college graduates. Uh, didn't have any parents or relatives in corporate America, so they didn't know the, the politics of cor corporate America. They didn't know the language. They didn't know how to move up. But we worked with them to create uh, a development plan with three levels of management, and those managers had to sign off on that and indicate how they would support the development of that woman. And it led to some very interesting um, interesting uh, developments uh, and successes. Uh, women developed the perfume industry in Africa for, for Procter & Gamble, and Procter & Gamble found that that method was so successful that they initiated for their entire company. But they also said uh, uh, that minorities began to be more successful because they didn't have the corporate experience. They found that they had nothing to lose. They, they didn't have the old tapes in their heads, so they were a lot more innovative. So I think there's some things we can do on this end, but I think also we need to open up the channels of communication uh, because there's not a natural communication flow between a white male who is usually the supervisor and a black female. There's no natural you know, discussion of sports or whatever would, would be in common with a black male, for instance. So I think there's a lot we can do and there's a lot, certainly, you laid out a lot that corporations can do, can do to open up opportunities and development opportunities for women. Well, I want to respond to that very instructive story of what you and Secretary Herman initiated some years ago. I want to respond to you, my NCNW sister, Paulette Lewis, who happens to be the co-chair of programs at NCNW to say, in doing this webinar, is it not clear that NCNW needs to ask of ourselves 
what role can we play now in helping to bring and sustain more Black women in corporate America? Yes, that's one reason I, I started the program with the financial literacy, because your financial health affects your physical health, the health of your family. So if we know more about money, how to handle it, how to make it grow, then we will put ourselves in a more healthy position all the way around. And I think there are other programs that, that we are also doing that will help women to understand how power and money are related and how that moves our uh, positions forward. Uh, but it is something I think we should study in detail. There are many aspects to it. And there, there are a lot of little th things that make a big difference in a short period of time. Mm. Ms. T. Lindsay, if you would uh, unmute, you could ask your question. Okay. Mr. Johannes. Yes, ma'am. There was one question that came through the chat that I, I would like to hear Dr. Cole answer. I, I apologize for not remembering the guest name. It is how do we break through the stereotypes? What is, yes. That is a great question. And the professor in me should never have presented a problem without at least suggesting some response, if not a solution to the problem. So I take your question and I take it lovingly. Stereotypes are so hard to get rid of. And that's because they really are not based in fact. <laughs> they are based in how one feels about something. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to have that reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And so while this may seem like dodging the question, I really think it goes back to fundamental education of youngsters who both consciously and unconsciously are taught stereotypes not only about Black women, but about all marginalized groups. Once we get to be adults, it's more difficult to unburden ourselves with these stereotypes. And that's why I'm calling for, especially during this period of heightened consciousness about racial inequities, for our schools, for our schools to address stereotypes. A little off our main subject. Think how many times in an early classroom of boys and girls, a stereotype is being reinforced. When a teacher and I've got to be honest and say it pains me to say it, but often it could be a woman teacher, calls on boys more than girls when it's a question of math, of science. That's already instituting a stereotype that, well, you know girls, they don't want to bother their pretty little heads with stuff like science and math. A stereotype that I remember encountering even at women's colleges. And what I mean by that is I remember the day when a Spelman student responded to my question, why did you come to Spelman? When, and I've got your record right here, 
You could have gone to any of the Ivies. Your SAT scores are off the chart. Your leadership qualities are admirable. Why did you choose Spelman? She said, because I am going to be an astrophysicist, Sister President. And I did not want any professor, whether by spoken word or by some other way, saying to me, honey, are you sure you can do physics? So stereotypes, and I gave only three of black women, have been chiseled into the American way of thinking since we first landed on these shores. These stereotypes will not just disappear because we demand that they do so, but they can disappear when we call them out. Remember James Baldwin, if we face an issue, if we call out a problem, we at least have some chance of addressing it. Sister E.D., would you like to weigh in on that? I think you've done a beautiful job, but I do want to share with you one of the comments that came across the chat. People are really making some insightful. This, uh, Sasha says, as a classroom teacher, I know the stereotypes are real. After taking an implicit bias workshop, I had to face my own biases and work to correct them. And then privately to you, I won't say the person's name, but that person wants to know how do we manage diversity hiring and promotion activities, ensure accountability of non-minority managers without the assumption of quotas? Well, I think it is something we ought to just spend a little time talking about. In my view, the very term quota was highly politicized a number of years ago. So let's put quota aside and let's remind ourselves that in any business, in fact, I'm willing to say in any operation, including in CNW, including in churches, synagogues, mosques, temples. You wouldn't dare think of trying to accomplish your mission without having some goals. You don't just wake up and say, hmm, let me see now. I uh, wonder what we should do today. It's corporate America. We, um, we're in the Fortune 500. What, what do you think we should do today? Obviously, the success of these corporations comes out of daily planning and goal setting. So if the word quota worries you, don't use it. How about goals? How about setting goals and importantly, incentivizing meeting those goals with rewards. And when those goals are not met, saying what happened, we better have some corrective action here. Another one of the questions we have here tonight is how do you confront the microaggressions of white women without them going to HR claiming that you're aggressive or afraid to or they're afraid to work with you? Oh, if, if I've experienced hearing that question once, whoever posed it, hear me, my sister, my brother, my sibling. I've heard it so many times. By microaggressions, we mean not what happens when somebody comes 
straight up and says, don't like you, never have liked your people, and never will. It's those subtle indications of bigotry and even of hatred. And it does pain me to say that microaggressions against black women in the workforce can come from other women. And yes, from white women. Excuse me if I take the time to give an example, and I think I, I used it when Howard Ross did a webinar with us on how COVID-19 has exacerbated health care, sorry, health disparities. I spoke about white women having power because white women do. It's not something that white women send in an application for. It's not something as a little girl, if you believed in Santa Claus, that you sent a note up to the North Pole that says, for Christmas, I want some power and privilege. It comes with being white in America. But here's the point. White women can use their power and privilege in a negative way against black women or they can use it in the interest of black women. The examples that I want to share because they are so, they're so powerful, I'm using that word, actually have to do with white women vis-a-vis -vis black men. We all read about what happened in Central Park when an African-American man was out bird watching. Now, how's that for stereotypes? You mean black people bird watch? Yes, some black people bird watch. A white woman was fairly close to where he was. She had her dog and the dog was not on a leash. And so the African-American man, Mr. Cooper said to her, I don't know the exact words, but it could well have been something like, ma'am, would you put your dog on a leash? There's a law that says you don't have a dog in this part of the park without a leash. She instantly felt and exercised her white woman power. Pulled out her phone, dialed the police and said, I am reporting a black man is harassing me. I can't tell you how that call reminds so many black people of what has happened throughout history and her story. That's the same call or the same scream that led to Emmett Till losing his life as a 14-year-old boy. When we look at the history of racial terror, of lynching in our country, so many of those lynchings were because the white woman said a black man had whistled at her, disrespected her, 
But now let me give you another story. This one, of course, is chiseled into our memory and we can't get it out. It's that moment when the knee, the knee of a Minneapolis policeman was in the neck of George Floyd. For well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, almost nine minutes. I don't know the name of this white woman, but I call her my Shiro because it is recorded that she used her power and privilege. Unfortunately, it was not sufficient to save George Floyd's life, but she got into that space in a way that no black woman, no woman of color, and no man of color could have done. She got into the space close enough to say, stop it. Take his pulse. Get your knee off of his neck. She used her white woman privilege in the interest of calling for social justice. I know that's a very long response to the question. But what I am saying is, you got the power and the privilege. So, by the way, do white men. The question is, how will you use it? Brings us to our next question. How can leaders of employee resource groups partner with NCNW to strengthen our support of AA female leaderships in corporate environments who feel invisible and marginalized? Sister E.D., would you talk about that? The, our employee resource groups, which I'm assuming everyone understands, are groups based on various kinds of identity, whether it's race or gender or sexual orientation or religion, and you'll take it from there. Thank you, Dr. Cole. I want to respond to that question by reading a comment from Linda and Velma Bagley. Linda Bagley is a member of NCNW. She is the co-president or co-leader of our New York organization. She writes, the Metropolitan Area Minority Employees of Xerox created an internal organization that recruited and then trained young employees, developed a path to management, and provided a support system for minorities at all levels throughout the organization. Although there was pushback from middle management, diversity was valued by senior management. Many of my mentors then remain an active part of my life today. A successful process exists and can be implemented. Linda is on the program committee for NCNW. And I am certain that if you want to approach NCNW, me, Dr. Cole, Linda Bagley, Paulette Norbell Lewis, who has been my mentor in this process, we will help you design a program to support diversity and inclusion in your organization that will be effective. So thank you for that. And there's a white woman in there, Mr. John, is, she said, I'm a white woman and I totally agree. Sister, that's why we can't judge people by the color of their skin. Here, here. Dr. Cole, I wanna thank you. It is now a little past 6 p.m. when we plan to adjourn. I could go on listening to you tell these stories and answer these questions for a good while longer but I don't want to overburden or overtax. How are you feeling? Do you want to take a few more? Or are you ready to call it a day? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm so energized by this conversation. And so maybe what we should say is for our sisters and brothers, our siblings all, if, if you need to roll off now, please do so but you have to take something with you. 
You have to take our gratitude for your participation. But for those who wish to stay just a little bit longer, why don't we say we could at least take a few more questions or comments? Here's one. Denise wants to know, Mr. Johannes, will there be a recording of this conversation that she can share with others? Yes, ma'am, this is being recorded. And we will place it on NCNW's website in a section to highlight it, and also we will uh, communicate it through our social media. And if anyone is interested in having the little data that we went through early, we will post that PowerPoint as well. Are there other questions or comments for Dr. Cole? T. Lindsay says, very helpful. As you outlined some great actions business leaders can take, but what can I do as a friend to be a good ally? Mm. What a wonderful question. Yes. Indeed. I've been thinking a lot about allyship and the importance of it. And let me preface what I'm about to say by indicating that even though we focus this evening on a question that, that just needs so much attention, it signals how far we have yet to go for true racial and gender equity for Black women. I am cautiously optimistic during this particular period that we are in. Cautiously optimistic because we really have been through similar periods. When we thought, this is it, enough is enough. And indeed, the dream that Dr. King articulated and that every person who believes in social justice has, surely that dream is about to happen now. But I am cautiously optimistic there's so many indications out there that maybe this time will be a little different. First of all, I am hearing white Americans use language that we have not often heard. We use this language all the time in Black circles, racism, systemic racism, white power and privilege. The number of white Americans, perhaps because cooped up with this horrible virus, they have had to see and look at things they didn't encounter before. Secondly, the number of corporate leaders who are speaking up and speaking out. And of course, I'm the most, I'll use the word, impressed when it doesn't just say down with systemic racism, but this is what we're going to do in our company to address systemic racism. And then thirdly, how could we not speak about these protests being led by young, multiracial, multi in every way, young people. If watching that, when it is done peacefully, if that doesn't give you hope, I don't know where you're going to find it. But I do know that hope 
is not a plan. Hope is a feeling. Hope is an aspiration. The issue is now what plans do we have for policies and programs on every level in our country, federal, state, local. What do we have for plans in every workplace, in not-for-profit organizations that will get us closer <coughs> that day that I don't have to describe because I think everybody on this or in this convening dreams of that day. Are there other questions or comments? Let's see, I can pull one from the chat. What recommendations do you offer for Black women who still are experiencing Black male privilege and microaggression? That's, that's a tough and very good question. Because it, in the spirit of openness and having a courageous conversation, the sister who posed the question is reminding us of what I said and perhaps overemphasized, our double jeopardy. And that is that we can be victimized, we Black women, not only because of the color of our skin, but because of our gender. And <laughs> sexism, or if you prefer the word patriarchy, is exercised not only by white men. There is something, even for men of color, that will allow them to use microaggressive behavior vis-a-vis -vis women folk, women of color, us black women. And the only thing that I can say is that when you feel that there is a safe space, and only if you feel there is a safe space, you can try to invite this African-American man to have a courageous conversation with you. It could be a conversation that begins by finding common ground, by talking about the microaggressions that you both experience based on race, as you then invite him to try to hear you in describing that microaggressions can also come from black men. But if you don't feel that space, and if the microaggressions are so strong that you really feel your very humanity is challenged, there's got to be a procedure in that workplace where you take it. It's probably called the Human Resources Office. Dr. Cole, if I could just tag on, there is a question from a, from a viewer, and she says, for young professionals who are discouraged by the current events, as well as the day-to-day -day challenges many face in corporate America, how do you recommend they advocate for themselves while managing the stereotypes assigned to Black women as angry and loud 
when the same attributes in others are viewed as ambitious and determined. Thank you for meeting with us. I would just like to attempt an answer or response because I recently had a situation very similar come up in my own immediate family. And what I said to that young professional was, first, don't lose your temper. And then go to HR and pose it as a question, not as a complaint. Pose the question something like this. As a hypothetical, if you were being minimalized or sidelined, or overlooked by your immediate supervisor, do you have any advice for how I should handle that situation? There are not many HR professionals who would not offer constructive advice if it's posed in that way. Sometimes people would rather be asked a question than told a tale. Well put, well put. Another uh, viewer wants to know, how do I join NCNW? Well, that's pretty easy. Go to ncnw.org, click on join, and the dues are remarkable, $50 per year. If you believe in this type of programming and you want to support it, we don't charge for visiting the webinars or downloading the materials. In fact, we hope you will. But if you believe in the mission to lead, advocate for, and empower women of African descent, their families and communities, join NCNW. And we do accept men as members of NCNW. And let's say a little bit about that. There is the Charles L. Franklin Associates named for a very righteous physician who's gone to glory, who believed deeply in the mission of NCNW. The Charles L. Franklin Associates are men folk who, like Dr. Charles L. Franklin, believe in the empowerment of Black women our families and our communities. In the interest of full disclosure, I will say that my husband, James D. Staten Jr., is the co-chair, along with our extraordinary brother, Harry Johnson. And so if there are men folk, brothers, on this Zoom right now, we urge you to join the C.L. Franklin Associates. Dr. Cole, here's a message from Amy Williams. Thank you for your time and intellect, Dr. Cole. I greatly appreciate your wise perspective, forthright answers, and courageous voice. You are truly an inspiring woman. God bless you, and I hope to hear and see more from you in the future. This white woman plans to support NCNW, exclamation point. To my sister, my sister of a different hue, thank you. Thank you now for your support of the National Council of Negro Women. I remind myself and I remind all of us that we were founded in 1935 by an iconic leader, an educator, who went on to do so many things in her life, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune did. But certainly among the things that she did was to insist that this struggle that we are in must have the support of white women and white men as well. And her friendship, her very special friendship with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt signaled the importance of that support. Of course, those of us in NCNW have implanted in our memories that photograph of that particular day 
at the Harlem YWCA when a young woman was asked to escort two famous women, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and Ms. Eleanor Roosevelt, who had come to the YWCA. Of course, that woman was not doctor then, but a young Dorothy Irene Height. So thank you for your support of NCNW. We can't do this work without support. At this point, we will conclude our broadcast. We encourage you to visit ncnw.org often. Most Thursday nights, we present a webinar, so please feel free to join us. September 25th through the 27th, we will do something that NCNW has not done before, and that is to present a virtual national convention. You can find registration information and details at ncnw.org. Thank you, God bless you, and good night. And a warm virtual hug to all of my NCNW sisters, brothers, my siblings all, and the new supporters who have joined us.